phase changes. A phase change is a transformation from one phase to another. It occurs when energy, usually in the form of heat, is added or removed from the substance. They are physical changes because it's only changing, it is only a change at the molecular level. So we're only changing the spacing um, in between the molecules, changing the um, uh, strength of the intermolecular forces. Liquid vapor equilibrium. Liquids are held closer to each other than in the gas phase, so there's more collisions among the liquid molecules. When liquid molecules have enough energy to escape from the surface, a phase change occurs. So vaporization, or evaporation, is the process in which a liquid transformed into a gas. At higher temperature, there's a greater kinetic energy, so there's more molecules to leave the liquid. In this diagram, we have uh, picture A at one temperature and picture B at a different temperature. Notice the uh, triangle piece, the colored area underneath the curve. That's actually the same amount of molecules with the same amount of kinetic energy. So you can see that at a higher temperature we have more um, molecules with the same amount of kinetic energy. Vapor pressure is only measurable when there's a fair amount of vapor present. It's the process of evaporation um, doesn't continue indefinitely. At the beginning you have just your liquid and those gases are moving into the, um, I'm sorry, those molecules are moving into the gas phase. Once the vapor phase is established, some of the molecules then can condense back down. So vapor pressure really is the pressure um, that the gas is exerting on the surface of the liquid. The rate of evaporation is constant at any given temperature and the rate of condensation increases with the increased concentration of the molecules in the vapor phase. So the more molecules you have as a gas, the more is going to condense back down into the liquid. So dynamic equilibrium, the rate of the forward process is exactly balanced by the rate of the reverse process. So you can't actually see a change in your volume of liquid. The equilibrium vapor pressure is the vapor pressure measured when the dynamic equilibrium exists between condensation and evaporation. It is the maximum vapor pressure of a liquid at a given temperature and constant at a constant temperature. So it's independent of the amount of liquid as long as some liquid is present. Vapor pressure should increase with an increase in temperature then. Molar heat of vaporization and boiling point. Molar heat of vaporization, or delta H, VAP, the energy required to vaporize one mole of a liquid. It's directly related to the strength of the intermolecular force that exists in the liquid. If, it is a, if the intermolecular force is strong, it takes a lot of energy to free the molecules from the liquid phase, and those liquids would then have a high delta H and a low vapor pressure. There is a relationship then between vapor pressure and temperature given by this equation. Now you can look at it in the um, y equals mx b form or you could look at it comparing two different pressures. So this is the way that we're going to use this equation. So the vapor pressure of ethanol is 100 milli millimeters of mercury at 34.9 degrees Celsius. What is the vapor pressure at 63.5 degrees Celsius if the heat of vaporization for ethanol is 39.3 kilojoules? All right, so we're going to take the natural log of our pressure, 100 millimeters of mercury, and we want to know what the new vapor pressure is, so that will be our X. That's equal to the delta H, 39. Now, the R value is the ideal gas law constant, 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. So I need to convert kilojoules to joules. And then we're going to multiply it by our temperatures. So we're going to say, um, thir oh, well, we have to be in Kelvin. I'm sorry. So let's convert these to Kelvin. 307.9 minus 336.5 Kelvin and then we're going to multiply those on the bottom.
So what we have is the natural log of 100 over x, and that's equaling a negative 1.305 on this side. Now all of these units are going to cancel out. So we're going to take the inverse natural log of both sides. So I have 100 millimeters of mercury divided by x equals 0.2712. And then solve for x. So my x is 369 millimeters of mercury. So one everyday example of heat of vaporization is the concept of perspiration. So it's used by the human body to maintain a constant temperature. Since water has strong intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding um, is a needing a considerable amount of energy to vaporize the water from your sweat. So the energy is supplied by the heat generated in various metabolic processes. So when you exercise, the heat that's building up internally is being um, regulated by sweating. So when we sweat, the uh, water absorbs the heat from our body, so our body is kept at a constant temperature. Boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to the external pressure. Normal boiling point of a liquid is the temperature at which it boils when the external pressure is 1 atm. So we have bubbles that form within um, the liquid. So if we look at our beaker, our beaker has bubbles. If we look at a single bubble, that would be the space here, and then this would be the surface or the water that's surrounding that bubble. When it forms, the liquid originally occupying that space then is pushed aside and the level of the liquid in the container is forced to rise. It's going to look like we have more liquid in there. The pressure exerted on the bubble is mainly atmospheric pressure but also some hydrostatic pressure which is the pressure due to the liquid. The pressure inside the bubble is due solely to the vapor pressure of the liquid. When the vapor pressure becomes equal with the atmospheric pressure, the bubble rises to the surface and then bursts. So we don't see bubbles coming off of the surface of the liquid because when it reaches the surface, it, the bubble bursts and the gas um, goes into the atmosphere. The stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the boiling point, so the higher the heat of vaporization. Critical temperature and pressure. Gas can be made to liquefy by cooling which decreases the kinetic energy enough for intermolecular force to become stronger and the molecules form small drops of liquid or apply pressure which reduces the average distance and the intermolecular force becomes stronger and the molecules form small drops of liquid. So the critical temperature is above which a gas phase cannot be made to liquefy. No matter how great the pressure, it's the highest temperature a substance can exist as a liquid. Critical pressure is the minimum pressure that must be applied to bring about liquefaction at the critical temperature. So this series of pictures here is actually um, going past the critical temperature. In the first uh, picture, picture A, it's just the normal substance. So we have some gas and then we have our clear liquid. In picture B, we have gone past the critical temperature, so we don't have any liquid. As picture C and D, as it's being cooled off, the liquid starts to reform. It looks cloudy to us because it's not all forming at the bottom. So in picture C, you have uh, liquid molecules being formed, and then as gravity takes over, it starts settling out at the bottom. Freezing is a transformation from liquid to solid, melting solid to liquid. Melting point of the solid, or the freezing point of the liquid, is the temperature at which the solid and liquid phase coexist in equilibrium. Normal melting and freezing point is the temperature at 1 atm. So a solid increases its temperature until it begins to melt. During the transformation from liquid to, or solid to liquid, the absorption of heat is used to overcome the attractive forces. The temperature, the kinetic energy, is not changing. So in our phase change diagrams, from A to B, when that process is taking place, the temperature, my Y value, is not changing. Once all the molecules are in the liquid phase, then the temperature can begin to um, increase again until we reach the boiling point. 
And then again, all of that energy is used to overcome the intermolecular forces and transform them all into the vapor phase. Once everything's in the vapor phase, then the temperature can start changing again. Molar heat of fusion is the energy required to melt one mole of a solid. The molar heat of fusion is smaller than the molar heat of vaporization because the molecules in the liquid are still fa fairly closely packed together. So going from the solid to liquid, we, while we have to create space, we don't have to create as much space as going from liquid to gas. A supercooling or supercooling can happen when a liquid is temporarily cooled below its freezing point. So when the heat is removed so rapidly, the molecules literally have no time to get into order, it's a supercooled liquid. It's a very unstable situation. So in the first picture, we have a supercooled liquid. If we add or disturb that structure, that substance at all, the solid immediately starts to form. And then you can see over time, it turns into a solid. The solid vapor equilibrium. You have sublimation, which is the process of the molecules going directly from solid to vapor, and deposition, where they go directly from vapor to solid. The vapor pressure of a solid is generally much less than that of the liquid because the molecules are more tightly held. So the molar heat of sublimation is the energy required to sublime one mole. And it's actually an illustration of Hess's law. The heat of fusion plus the heat of vaporization equals the heat of sublimation. But it's only if all of the phases are hap um, changes are occurring at the same temperature. Phase diagrams. So a phase diagram is the um, summary of the conditions under which you have a solid, liquid, and a gas. So you have three regions to represent the three phases, and then each line separating those phases indicates the conditions you need to undergo a phase change. If you notice in the picture or the phase diagram from for water, the um, line between liquid and solid has a negative slope. This tells us that the solid is actually less dense than the liquid. The triple point, the point where our three phases meet, is the only condition under which all three phases can be in equilibrium with each other. Now if we look at carbon dioxide, the phase diagram looks similar with one exception, and that's that line between the liquid and solid. Notice this time it has a positive slope, which means our solid is more dense than our liquid. In fact, this phase diagram is more similar to all the other different substances out there than water because water has that unique property of having its solid less dense than the liquid.